Hey folks, uh, our next program here on the stage of the World Conservation Forum is, you know, all the topics fits to the perspective of sustainability. So this topic actually is about the ecological crisis, what we are in, and the ways or the steps that means hope for us and for the future. So we will listen to the, to the level of how vulnerable is our world now. And our presenter is the, is the director of the Rachel Carson Center, Christoph Mauch. Enjoy. Jonapot Kivanok, Kersenem Sepen, thank you very much uh, for introducing me. Uh, Miki, thank you for inviting me. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to be here in Budapest. It's been a few, few years since I was here last time. Last time I came by bicycle from Bavaria to Budapest along the Danube, which was a beautiful ride. This time I didn't have enough time, but I'm showing you a picture of the area where I come from, Bavaria. This is Germany's first national park, the Bavarian Forest National Park that was founded in 1970. I will not, not talk about this. I will talk in the beginning about something that is pretty scary. Mickey just said, your topic is very scary. And there's every reason to believe that we live in, a, in an ecological crisis, in an age of ecological crisis. So I will start with crises, and I will finish with hope. So we live in an era of unprecedented ecological destruction, and we are afraid of it. This is not happening somewhere in the world. It's happening very close by. This is just a few weeks ago when several people, hundred, uh, several hundred people in Germany died as a result of flooding. And this is not so far away. It's Turkey. It's not Australia. When wildfires, vast wildfires destroyed part of Turkey. This is not the Sahara. This is not very far from here. It's the Loire River that was uh, <clears throat> full of drought. There are ecological crises everywhere, and we know about it, and we have every reason to fear them. But is there hope? How can there be hope in our time and age? We realize that we are vulnerable because of the risks that we took. There's one figure in mythology, in Greek mythology, the figure of risk and vulnerability par excellence. Um, do you know him? Have heard of him, perhaps? Prometheus. Prometheus is the guy who stole fire from the gods, and as a result, he made the planet a more livable planet. Prometheus stole the fire. Just imagine if we had no fire, what would happen to us? Nobody would live in Hungary. You couldn't live in Hungary in the wintertime. Everybody would have to live in the tropics. We wouldn't have comfort, we wouldn't have heating, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't even be able to eat meat. We would only eat plants and insects. But with fire, things changed, made our life better. But at the same time, for stealing the fire from the gods, Prometheus, this is him, he stole the fire from the gods. After stealing the fire from the gods, he was suffering. Every day, an eagle came and ate away his liver. It's horrible. Every night, the liver grew back, but during the day, the eagle came and ate his liver. Now, I stick this image with you, the image of the brave person who stole the fire. There seems to be an um, interesting sound here. Um, it seems like a car wants to come in here. Anyways, um, I, uh, I think it's an interesting image for us that, there's, uh, that Prometheus is a figure both of risk-taking and a figure of, that is vulnerable. And I think we humans are very much like this. We have taken risks, but we also realized that uh, this has made us more vulnerable. We have encroached nature all over the Earth. And I show you something that is really striking. 
look at the big green circle. The big green circle has the size of Africa. You need the size of Africa just for cattle, just for animals. You know, that's what we need for them to graze for the food and the water they need, the size of Africa. And if you look at the other circle, the smaller circle is the size of South America. This is how much we need for our food that is not animal food. And if you look to the right, all the other areas to the right are the size of Europe plus Australia. We need Europe and Australia for our cities, for our roads, for logging, for urban areas, for rural housing and businesses. So just imagine Australia, Europe, Africa, and Latin America are all covered by what we changed as humans. And there's only 46.5%, today even less because these numbers are not the latest, only 46.5% left that we haven't changed. But we didn't change some of them because we couldn't change them. They're in the Arctic, for instance. Nobody can live in the Arctic or they're in the desert. Uh, or they're in the high mountains, in the Andes or in the Himalayas. We've changed the earth. We've changed it so much. Also, the soil. Imagine how many percent do you think of the topsoil was lost in the last 150 years? How much do you think was lost? Topsoil and humus are absolutely needed for us to plant trees, to plant food. What do you think is the percentage? that was lost in just 150 years, 50% of the topsoil that is dearly needed was lost. We can't continue like this, and we know it. Look at the animals. This is what, on the top row, you see what the animals used to look like. I mean, a chicken like that on the left would have produced maybe 40 eggs a year. Today, our chicken produce well over 200 eggs. We've changed the chicken for our needs. We've made it comfortable for us. It's like stealing fire. We've done something that made our life better because the chicken lay eggs every day, almost every day. Look at the sheep. You can see some of the wild sheep in some of the halls around here. Look what the sheep used to look like. They had no wool. We've changed the sheep over and over so that we would have wool. So we would have wool for uh, clothing. We changed. The, the pigs, look what the pigs looked like. They didn't have a lot of fat, they didn't have a lot of muscle. They were wild, they were running around. Now we make them sit. We've changed the animal world around us, totally. Everything for our needs was our comfort, made our life more comfortable. Now, most of the livestock, just look at this. If you go back in history, go back 500 years, 500 years ago, all the wild animals you see here, the, the elephants, the giraffes, the zebras, the rhinoceroses, the hippopotamuses, etc. All the wild animals together, if you put them on a, on a, on a scale, they would, their, their weight would have been enormous, very, very heavy. Whereas the animals that we raised on farms like pigs and cattle were very light. But today, things have changed. If you count the weight of all humans, eight or nine billion humans, if you count that weight and the weight of all the animals that we've ra raised, then it's almost 96%. So the wild animals have gone. This is the shocking news. Well, we are living from, you know, 75% of our food comes just from five animals and from 12 plants. As humans, we can eat not a thousand, but way over 2,000 plants, but we are only eating 12 of them in order to feed ourselves 75% of our food. So we just eat corn and rice and uh, wheat, etc. But most of the plants that are out there we don't use. It makes it easy for us because we can have industrial agriculture, we can have big plants, we can have monoculture, but that also makes it vulnerable. To eat only 12 plants and five animals is very risky. So we are a little bit like Prometheus who has taken a risk and has become vulnerable. We have become vulnerable because we are reducing, we're putting everything in one. It's like playing roulette and putting everything on a few numbers. And if other numbers come up, we are lost. Now, if you look back in history, look at the blue curve first. If you go back really far in history, 
if you go back thousands of years this way, thousands and ten thousands of years, human population was very, very low. It didn't rise. It was very low for thousands of years. But it changed with the Industrial Revolution around 1800. It started to grow. And then after World War II, it started to grow tremendously. So the, this curve is enormous. This is in itself a problem because we are, as you saw, we have changed most of the planet, more than half of the land. But what is worse and what is most shocking, and that is our ecological crisis, is the orange line. You can see the orange line. This is the extinction of species. So the more humans there are on the planet, the more creatures become extinct. We'll soon have 9 or 10 billion inhabitants on the Earth. By that time, a lot of animals that are still alive today, a lot of species will have got, been gone. We live in the age of the Anthropocene. Anthropos means human, scene means age. And look at this image. You can see that we have changed the face of the Earth through concrete. We have invaded the ocean. This is somewhere in America. We actually built in the ocean. And uh, we have produced cement and uh, here concrete. And we've changed the crust of the Earth. Imagine the Earth. The Earth is always changing because of nature. Nature, there's wind, there's erosion, there's volcanoes, there is uh, earthquakes. So the crust of the Earth is changing because nature is changing the crust of the Earth. But we, humans, have changed the crust of the Earth as well by building houses, by building channels, by canals, by uh, producing synthetic materials, like, for instance, like plastic. So this is why we call it the Anthropocene. Humans are a geological factor. In the past, uh, nature was the main factor, but uh, that changed the crust of the Earth, wind, etc., changed the crust of the Earth. Today, we are the main factor. We humans are a geological force. And that is where our fears come from. We realize we can do a lot. We are like, we are like Prometheus. We can change everything. We can make our life comfortable. We don't have to live in caves or in trees. We live in houses. We, have, we can move around. We have uh, cars. We have heating. We have beautiful uh, houses, etc. But we have changed the crust of the earth tremendously. And this, as a result, has made us also vulnerable. So the fears that we have are multiple. We are afraid of a blackout. We've seen some of the blackouts in India, in particular, for several days. Just imagine what happens with a blackout in a hospital. There's no more instruments working, no medical instruments. Imagine what happens with um, the uh, food in refrigerators. People will not have food if we, we don't have electricity. We are afraid of droughts all over because of climate change. We are afraid of flooding because of climate change. And we are, of course, afraid of pollution. Yes, we have been successful, very successful, in getting our uh, moving from A to B quickly by having cars. So many people have cars all over the world now. This is Beijing. Beijing has crowded streets. Just 20 years ago, everybody in China was cycling. Today, people are taking the car everywhere, and there's enormous pollution. Same problem and the same thing happens with water. If we put medication or um, fertilizer in the water and use it in agriculture, it destroys our globe. These are our fears. And this is my main point here, that we fear our power. We know we are powerful. We can use medication. We can make the fields of our uh, in agriculture much more profitable. We can move around quickly. We ha can have a comfortable life. We take risks, though, and we become more vulnerable. So we are powerful, but we are also powerless. And we are afraid both of our power and of our powerlessness. Like Prometheus, the guy who stole the fire and whose liver was destroyed every night. There is a term called slow violence by the Princeton scholar Rob Nixon. He says, 
the violence that happens is very invisible. That's why he calls it slow. So we are doing a lot of things here. We are exporting our cars. We are taking our cell phones to uh, Africa. And people are taking out the rare earths and the metals. But we are destroying the lives of people on the other side of the globe. It looks good for us. We are clean. But others are suffering from slow violence. And what are we doing? We are sticking our head in the sand. We need something else. But what are we actually doing? Look at the acceleration. You know these curves. You know how uh, floods are increasing. You know how uh, the money is increasing, population is increasing, the number of motor vehicles, telephones, the number of McDonald's restaurants, all of these, the paper production, this extinction is increasing. All these curves go up so steep. And one thing we know is, I mean, the steeper the curve, the more accelerated, the more quickly things are happening, the more destruction is happening. So what we need is not acceleration, but a slowing down. But do we have that? This is the Rhine River in the, 19, in the 18th, 17th century. But in the 19th century, we made the Rhine River shorter by 75 kilometers, so we could go quickly from A to B. To have more money made life easy, made it comfortable, but it also made us vulnerable because we now have much more flooding. Look at the train. Imagine in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, when the trains were introduced, if they went at 50 kilometers per hour, people who went on the train were very scared. 50 kilometers per hour, that's nothing. But in the 19th century, after riding horses or walking around, when they saw the landscape move on the train, looking out of the window, they were scared. They said, oh, the trains, they're so, so frightening. They're so fast. They move so quickly. Today, of course, trains go at 300 kilometers. In the beginning of the 20th century, trains went at about 100 kilometers. But rockets are 100 times faster today. So we've accelerated transportation and mobility. Look at culture. In the 1920s, when people were playing jazz, they were playing jazz, and uh, people were afraid because they were so f that it was such a hectic and fast music. So today, however, we think of jazz as something very laid back. I mean, we can listen to jazz music on a Sunday afternoon and relax. But in the 1920s, we thought this was quick, fast music. So acceleration is everywhere in mobility, but also in culture. Look at this. To me, this is one of the most shocking things. In Hungary, in the Middle Ages, an average household had 30 objects. Like, you would have a table, but you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have uh, plates, cutlery. You wouldn't have books. You had a few instruments that you needed for agriculture, but not much more. You only needed 30 objects. In 1900, there were about 400 objects. But now comes, for me, the biggest shock. That is, in 2020, we have 15,000 objects. Just imagine, a life is about 80 years long today. Maybe in 1500, it was 40 years. If you buy 30 things, that's nothing. But if you buy 15,000 things and use them, like sculptures, pictures, kitchen appliances, all sorts of vehicles, all the things that we have in our household, they have multiplied so much. Does this make our life a better life? Think about it. I doubt it, because you have much less time because of the acceleration of consumption, things that we throw away. In the Middle Ages, you had maybe one pair of shoes. Now we buy, I don't know how many shoes you buy, probably dozens every, in every life. So what we know is we must not forget that there is violence, slow violence, and that we have made part of the uh, global south very vulnerable. But we also need different stories. We need stories that slow us down. So my hope is that we can find stories that help us slow us down. Let's go back to Prometheus, the guy who stole the fire from the gods, and he was suffering. One day, one of the gods came, took a bow and arrow, and killed the eagle. Now, do we have such a god who can kill the eagle? There are some people who tell us, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Get an electric car. Get, oh, everybody needs an electric car. And then the problems will be solved. But we all know that doesn't solve our problems. Or some people who say, let's go to Mars. 
Uh, yesterday, somebody was standing on this stage said, yes, we can solve the problems by going to another planet. But when is that happening? It takes more than my lifetime for me to travel to Mars. And how is that going to help me? There is nobody with a, with a bow and arrow that can save us at this point. So what we need are creative ideas. We don't need one idea like cold fusion is going to save us or some one idea. I think we need many ideas and we need our minds to change. And I have a few examples. So what we need to do, we need to think about the curve that is slowing down, not an acceleration, but a slowing down. We need the red curve to be the, the curve of hope, things that are making our world less problematic, le less uh, ecologically destructive, and make our world less vulnerable. So here is my first example. This is in Taiwan. I met an architect. His office is actually a treehouse on the campus of his university. This is. Uh, the, the picture I took from his office, looking down on the campus, he said, I've been here for 40 years now in this university. I wanted to change the city. I wanted to make it more green, but I couldn't. And I told him, 40 years, look what you've done with your campus. Your campus had a big wall. You were undigging a river around the campus. You changed your campus. You have meditative uh, squares, you have a lot of animals that used not to be there. You have changed a lot in these 40 years. And I realized when I talked to him that it's important to go back in history. I'm a historian. It's important to go back in history to realize that things have improved. And we need to find stories like this because the, the students of Tsai Jen Hui, this architect of the university, are doing similar things in campuses and universities all around the globe. So there would be a, a story of hope. There would be a curve of hope. A lot of positive things happening. Another example is Portland, Oregon. This used to be the most polluted city in America, in the United States, on the West Coast. 180 days in the 1970s, you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. It was so polluted, it was illegally polluted. There was DDT in the river after World War II. But today, Portland looks like this. There is hope. Even in a city, there are urban gardens. We know that all over the United States, there are now 10,000 farmers markets. There used to be only 2,000 uh, in uh, 1980. So that is a curve of hope. We have to think about things that we can change ourselves. Or this is also Portland, Oregon. There used to be postcards with the highway in Portland, Oregon. They were so proud of their highway, so proud. But Today, the highway looks like this. Portland, Oregon, in the 1970s, was the first city in America that tore down the highway. And you see the green here. This green, people are jogging, people are cycling. This is where the highway used to be, and they are much happier. Or Sponge City. Portland, Oregon turned its roofs and part of its sealed spaces into grassland so that the water is not lost, so that it doesn't flood the whole area. So remember what I showed you before. Remember the globe and how much we've modified. We can put some things back into the original position by naturalizing them. Portland is now the number one city for cyclists in the whole of the United States. It's got the longest bridge in the world for public transportation and uh, bicycles. No cars allowed. And Portland has brought its birds back. All the birds were gone, but now they are back, especially the blue heron. So what the city did, they now have special places for birds. They have pillars. They have birds coming back to the uh, bridges. They have birds coming back to the lampposts. And they made the blue heron a symbol of the city. The mayor of Portland said, our symbol is a bird. And finally, they make fun of themselves. There is a wonderful series that you should watch if you have time, because a lot of people in Portland actually have goats and chicken in their backyard in the middle of the city. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, there's a series called Portlandia. You should watch it if you haven't watched it. It's a wonderful, funny series that is satirical. So being, uh, you know, joking about it is also important. Ocean optimism. In 2009, there was the first ocean reserve on the deepest point of the ocean with 95,000 square miles. Since then, there have been 13 reserves that are larger than the original one. So it takes a long time to make the ocean 
an area that is good for creatures that live in it. But there are 50 million people who are using the hashtag ocean optimism, and they're working towards making more and more, pre preparing more and more, and establishing more and more reserves on the ground of the ocean. And if you look at, for instance, uh, octopuses, you know, um, octopuses with their tentacles, if you leave them alone for uh, don't fish in the area, they can reproduce very, very quickly. It's not the same with fish, but octopuses, for instance. So nature can help you, can provide some slow hope over time. Leave an octopus area alone three to six months, and the population, if it's almost nothing, will go back to normal. So nature can help us with slow hope as well. Well, I dropped this, but I go to Munich, because this is my city where my university is, um, and the Isar in the 19th century was straight, just like the Rhine, like I showed you before, so that people could move quicker on the Isar, could use it for navigation. Today, it looks like this, and people enjoy it. So it was re-naturalized. So we see many projects like this, projects of slow hope. And I think we should talk about these hopeful projects rather than only about the fears. And we should work towards re-naturalizing some of our rivers. Imagine in the summertime at the Isar River in Munich, people are just crowding there. They're swimming there. They're having grill parties there. And it's, a, it's all the reason for hope. Here is London. Those of you who've read thrillers about London in the 19th century have read about Jack the Ripper, who killed people in the fog at night. Everybody believed that it was fog, but it was not fog. London was known for its fog, but the fog of London was not fog. The fog of London was smog. And in 1952, the smog in London was so bad that 12,000 people in London died prematurely because of the bad air. As a result, four years later, the government of London introduced very strict regulations, and now they even introduced a low emission zone with fewer and fewer cars. I used to cycle in London in the, uh, when I was a student a long time ago, and I returned, and it was very, very different. It was horrible to cycle in London, but today it is relatively enjoyable. There is also hope in food. In the 1980s, some of you may have heard about it, in a remote area of Italy, in the northwest of Italy, so-called Piedmont, which was an area that was vulnerable and poor. There had been a lot of uh, yeah, the violence in World War II and beyond. Uh, in that area, there were people who started to think differently about food. They realized our area is poor. We can never do industrial, uh, industrial agriculture like others. We don't have flat fields. We can't have big machines. So why don't we do the opposite? Why don't we, instead of producing more and more and more, produce better and better and better quality? So they started to produce good wine, and they started to use local products for their food. This was in the 1980s, at a time when, in, uh, when there were protests against the bad wine that the Italians made because they put chemicals in it. And in that part of Italy, they changed from fast food, like McDonald's, to slow food. And the slow food movement, since the 1980s, has appeared everywhere in the world. 160 countries and hundreds of thousands of people around the world have joined the slow food movement. Cradle and cradle, this is a crazy concept in a way. My friend Michael Braungard, a chemist, said, we have to think different about technology. We have to think about technology like we think about trees. A tree has leaves, and the leaves are falling down, and the nutrition from the leaves goes up back in the tree. Everything that we produce has to be feeding back. And so he and his colleagues created a lot of interesting things. For instance, they created a seed for Lufthansa that is edible. I mean, it's for the first class. I'm not flying in that seat. And I also, if I was flying, I wouldn't eat it. But uh, it's edible material. It's not toxic. It's not chemical. It's synthesized, but it's compostable. So they're producing compostable books. They're producing shoes that lose seeds when you run with them. So thinking about technology as a circle like nature is one of the options. Now, many people have said that the Paris Climate Summit was useless because nothing is happening. 
But if you go back in history, there were other climate summits in Rio and in Copenhagen, and then recently in, in Paris. Paris has achieved a lot that we had not achieved before. There are now indigenous people involved. There are now countries like Mexico and China involved. So many countries uh, came together like never before and agreed on a 1.5 degree lowering. This might not happen, but if you look back in history, you can see that there's slow hope because in the 1990s, this would have been unimaginable. So there's a curve of hope and reason for optimism. Finally, I think we need a, we need a new language. We need a language uh, because language is really important. About uh, my great-grandfather, you know, my grandmother told me about her father. My great-grandfather, when he grew up, he, they didn't have cars. He didn't, he didn't have a car. He was not interested in fossil fuels. So we can think of the beginning of the fossil fuel era. Why can't we think of the end of the fossil fuel era? We should start to think about and talk about the end of the fossil fuel era. This will give us hope. And finally, if you say this can only happen in a, in a, in a small town or it can only happen in some restricted area, this is an example of hope too. Costa Rica is almost climate neutral in 2021. On most of the days, it's been climate neutral. So a whole country can be climate neutral. And finally, my last image. It's a bit more complicated. But if you go back in history, what we used wood for was basically to make money. Wood was, if we cut it down, it gives us money, it gives us building materials, we can sell it. Over time, we realized that forests are more than money makers. Over time, we realized that forests are something that give us leisure, they are working against erosion, they can clean the air, they reduce uh, the CO2, they cool down the climate, all these functions. But what is more, just a few years ago, a book came out by Peter Wohleben that is published and translated into 30 languages. And Peter Wohleben says, we are now thinking about the wood wide web. We realize that trees are creatures like we. Trees and fungi, the roots, they're communicating. Trees are communicating with one another. So there has an ecological thinking about trees has developed. We don't think of forests just as bunny makers today. We don't think of them as only areas for recreation. We also think of trees as individuals like humans. And this is reason for hope, for slow hope. And I will end with this. I thank you very much for your attention. Köszönöm.